What is up guys? Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. We're going to be talking about a situation that's very specific to a certain type of game. And as a result, the situation often goes without deeper analysis. In this episode of the Red Chip Poker Podcast, we're going to be thinking about that situation in a bit more depth. The title of this episode is Knit Colonies. Now, on some level, we're probably familiar with the idea of a knit. It's a player who is playing overly tight in terms of preflop starting hand selection. And although it's not typically considered the correct way of playing poker, sometimes these knits perhaps even generate positive win rates simply by virtue of the fact that they're playing extremely tight. Now, knits make an appearance in most poker networks, in most games. However, there are certain types of games which attract nits in very large quantities. In fact, you could even describe the amount of nits as nothing more than a nit colony. So which particular games are we talking about? Well, very often we find large quantities of nits in lower limit online games. So although we might find nits in live games, we won't usually find a whole table full of nits. We might just have that one guy who's playing a little bit tighter than everyone else. Lower limit online games, it's possible to be sat at a table, perhaps a six-handed table, where four of the six players on the table have a VPIP of below 20%. And if we take a look at the lobby, we'll see that there are numerous other tables in a similar situation with three or four overly tight players on those tables. In other words, it's a network that's been flooded by extremely tight players. We especially find that this is the case for fast format games. Note that playing a very tight strategy like a knit is really not that interesting. It's quite boring, in fact. And the effect of that is only amplified in a live environment. For most players, it's simply too boring to be a knit in a live environment. Hours could pass without us actually playing a hand. Whereas if we think about something like lower limit fast format games, it's a little bit more tolerable to be an extremely tight player in a fast format game. Because even if we only play 18% of all of our total hands, if we're, let's say, four tabling a fast format game, we're perhaps getting close to a thousand hands per hour. Especially if you're a nit, by the way, nits get dealt more hands per hour because they're not really playing many of their hands, they're just clicking fold a lot. It's much more tolerable to be a nit in a fast format environment because it's very easy to get dealt into the next hand. Of course, in order for the fast format games to be running in the first place, we find that nits especially like rooms with high traffic because rooms with low traffic don't have a fast format offering. There are simply not enough players in the pool to make a fast format offering viable, and hence they only offer reg tables. And finally, we see nits especially like games with high rake back offerings. And if you think about two of the biggest names in terms of online poker room at the moment with a fast format offering, we have GG Poker with the Russian cash format, And according to their advertising, at least, they offer up to 60% rake back. Now, of course, the catch here is that it's based around something they refer to as the player value index. So when they say potentially 60% rake back, it doesn't mean that most players are going to get anywhere close to that. Of course, the nits don't necessarily know that. They just see a high rake back offering. In second place after GG, we have PokerStars. And at the time of recording this podcast episode... Pokestars are offering 40% flat rate back through rewards chests. In fact, I think you can get more than 40% in terms of rate back from stars. And the mentality of some nits is that they're there not necessarily to make money by beating other players, but simply to make money through the rate back system. They can just grind out a bunch of volume, not really getting involved in too many spots. They'll slowly build up profit as a result of the rake back they're receiving from the room. Of course, here the thing is, the viewpoint is technically flawed. And that's because anytime we generate a positive win rate after rake back 
it means that we have to be generating a positive win rate against the pool on average. If on any given session you pay $10 in rake and receive $5 back from the room in terms of rake back, but you've broken even for the session, it means you've technically made $5 just by playing against the player pool. So the idea of simply floating around the environment, picking up those rake back dollars via osmosis is perhaps a flawed or an inaccurate way or misleading way of thinking about rake back. Again, nits don't necessarily know this. They're just hoping that if they play a bunch of volume, they'll hopefully profit as a result of all of that rake back. So what is the end result of all this? Well, if you fire up low limit Russian cash table on GG, certainly including limits up to 25 NL, or if you fire up a zoom table on stars, again, up to 25 NL, you're going to find that the games are absolutely flooded with extremely tight players. And this can create a bit of a problem because there's a disconnect between the training content you might find online and the way that the games are actually playing, assuming we're talking about one of these environments has been turned into a knit colony. We're simply going to assume our opponents are significantly looser than they actually are. And the end result is something that I'll refer to as the cooler effect. Now, we all know what a cooler is in poker. It's a situation where we have a hand that's so strong that it's incorrect to fold, even if we sometimes end up losing. So simple example is something like flopping a set on a dry texture in Hold'em, 100 big blinds deep. Probably not supposed to fold at any point. If our opponent wants to get all the chips in on the flop, we look down and see we have middle set, probably should just be getting the chips in. Of course, some of the time our opponent's going to have top set, but that doesn't mean we should have got away from our hand. We should still stack off anyway because his range is going to be much wider than just top set. So we refer to that situation as a cooler. The cooler effect is a little bit different from a cooler. You see, the cooler effect just gives us the feeling that we've been coolered. When we actually break the situation down and see the bigger picture, we haven't actually been coolered. It's more like we've been knit farmed. So you may experience this if you're playing in lower limit fast format pools, it may feel like you are continually getting coolered. How come every time I have bottom set, my opponent has mid set or top set? But here's the thing, it's a cooler because we assume our opponent's range is much wider than just the nuts. We assume that when we have bottom set, our opponent also has top pair, top kicker or two pair type hands that he's stacking off with. But what happens if our opponent is so tight He's such a nit that he only stacks off with top set in that specific situation. Well, that's not a cooler anymore. If we don't realize our opponent is a huge nit, we might mistakenly assume that it's a cooler, but it's not actually a cooler. And this is the problem. If we're playing on a table full of nits and we're repeatedly being dealt into a table that's full of nits, but we don't realize we're playing against nits, this is what generates the cooler effect. We're perhaps in disbelief that every single time we get the chips in, our opponent has some ultimate super giga nuts. How are we this unlucky? Why does our opponent always have it? That's because he doesn't stack off with anything worse. He's playing a very, very tight, nitty strategy. Hopefully we can see the importance of recognizing that our opponent is a nit. Because we need to differentiate between situations that are legitimate callers and situations where we're just running into a very, very tight player who really isn't stacking off with anything worse. This is why it's really important to identify who the nits are in the pool. We want access to HUD data, and we want to get colored tags on all opponents who are playing a range that's very tight, and let's say below a certain threshold. We'll talk about this a bit more later in this podcast episode, but certainly if someone has an 18 VPIP or less, we want to be getting a nit tag on that particular opponent. So now that we've classified which of our opponents are nits, we want to think about counter strategy. And there are three weaknesses in a nit strategy. There's two critical weaknesses, but there are other weaknesses we can exploit as well in terms of post-flop play. The first critical weakness of the nit is hugely under defending against pre-flop opens. We'll talk about this shortly, but that's naturally the main area of focus for us. We want to be exploiting the fact 
that our opponents are not playing many hands pre-flop. Critical weakness number two for a knit is underbluffing significantly in key spots. And we'll talk about what those key spots are shortly. Finally, in terms of an example of a more general weakness, we find that knits overfold in a bunch of post-flop scenarios. And this is kind of interesting because you might imagine the opposite to be true. This might seem counterintuitive. We might imagine if we have a player who is significantly under defending preflop, when they do defend, they must have something reasonable. And as a result, they're then going to proceed to fold less post-flop. Whereas what we actually find according to player pool data is that despite having that stronger range that sees the flop, nits have a tendency to still overfold in a variety of post-flop scenarios. Let's take each of these weaknesses one by one and consider them in a little bit more depth. So critical weakness number one, that is hugely under defending pre-flop. So how to exploit this? We're looking for situations where we can raise 100% of buttons, small blinds, and in some cases, even 100% of cutoffs. Although this particular situation is a little bit less common, we won't usually raise any two on the cutoff, but it is possible for such a situation to exist. And even if we don't raise any two cards on the cutoff, there are many situations where we can raise a very wide range on the cutoff by virtue of the fact that we have two or even three nits behind us. So now that we've got those color tags on our opponent, anytime we're in a situation on the button, we look in the blinds, we see two knit tags on our opponents. What should we be doing? We should be open raising 100% of buttons. Assuming we are deliberately raising very wide purely for the purpose of trying to pick up the blinds pre-flop, it usually makes sense to make use of small sizing. And there are a couple of reasons for this. If we do have something very, very trashy, like Jack Six Offsuit, for example, if we do get action, we would prefer that the pot is small because simply our hand isn't very good. But also small sizings have a tendency to naturally exploit population tendencies. So what we find when we look at population data is that in general, the player pool defends better against 3x opens than they do against min raises. So the larger the open raise sizing, the less likely it is that our opponent is overfolding. Another way of phrasing that is that our opponents will overfold more significantly against min raises than they will against 3x opens. So min raise is naturally, according to pool data, a better choice for a blind still. Again, this can sometimes feel counterintuitive because a min raise may actually work less often than a 3x open but we don't need a min raise to work as often in order to be profitable simply because we're investing less. So we can just get comfortable with the fact that it might work a bit less often since it's a small open, but proportionally, it's actually working more often. It's generating high EV because it's exploiting a natural imbalance in the way the player pool is defending against opens. We may also find spots to expand our raising range from MP and UTG. I've been in situations in these lower limit fast format environments where let's say I'm UTG and the five players behind me are all nits. They all have a VPIP of 18 or less. So this is something that doesn't happen in high stakes games. It doesn't happen in live environments, but it happens specifically in lower limit online games. And it's very important to be aware of who the nits are. So imagine with five nits behind, the correct RFI range from UTG is not going to be the GTO correct 18%. It's obviously going to be somewhat more aggressive than that. Okay, let's think about critical weakness number two that we can exploit, and that is under bluffing. And there are specific key areas where the average nit is never going to show up with a bluff, and they may not even show up with as many value hands as they should. We've already discussed a situation where we're stacking off on the flop and perhaps our opponent should, in theory, stack off with top pair dot kicker or some two pair type hands or bottom set, but they only stack off with mid set and top set. So that's very similar to the idea of under bluffing. But in terms of river bets, 
we find that the average nit just doesn't really bluff. If they do sometimes bluff, their bluffing frequency will be well below a GTO correct bluff to value ratio. So examples of spots where the average nit will under bluff, first of all, triple barrel lines. So if we think about how a solver plays against a triple barrel, a GTO solver is going to be bluff catching some fairly weak top pair type hands. It's even going to be bluff catching some second pair type hands. It really just depends on the blocker effects. But both of these bluff catchers are going to be suicidal when a nit decides to triple barrel. In fact, we're going to need something very strong to call a triple barrel from a nit. Other examples include river raises. Average nit probably, realistically, is going to have 0% bluff raising range when they raise our river bets. Large sizings are a fairly big tell as well. Nits don't overbet light. In fact, if a nit ever overbets on any street, it's very likely to be the stone cold nuts, or at least very close to it. Preflop four bets, very, very strong line from a nit. Even a three bet is a strong line from a nit. So by the time we're facing a preflop four bet from a nit, very, very often going to be kings plus only. Just to give an example of the mentality of a nit, it may be the case that if a nit open raises ace king offsuit or pocket queens and faces a three bet, they will never ever four bet against a three bet. The reason is simple. They're concerned that since their opponent three bet, he might have kings plus. And obviously queens and ace king is going to be an underdog against that range. This is especially true of cold four bets, by the way. These lines are even stronger. In fact, even the average non-nit opponent may have a cold full bet range which is exclusively kings plus but especially from a knit a knit might not even cold full bet kings it's certainly possible so really if we summarize this as a single exploit it's that we need to be very careful when our opponent signals any interest through his aggression levels and we have to be willing to make fairly big hero folds we can't necessarily just analyze a situation through a theory lens. For example, we flop two pair. According to Solver, that's going to be a stack off all day on the flop. So let's just get the chips in. Oh, okay, our opponent has top set. Well, that's a bit unlucky, that's a cooler. Actually, maybe it's not a cooler. Maybe villain is a nit. And we have to be very careful with our two pair type hand when facing aggression. It's actually now very likely that our two pair should have been folded, even though it's theoretically incorrect to fold hands above a certain strength we need to be willing to make those big laydowns because the way that we exploit nits is not by fighting against their aggression, it's by fighting against them when they're not being aggressive. We've seen an example of that already, which is hyper-aggressive pre-flop steals. But if we then start paying off the nit post-flop when he has something, that's going to nullify all of the edge we've generated with our pre-flop strategy and more. We could find ourselves in a situation where we're now just playing a losing strategy against the knit. Now, preflop is not the only spot where a knit is overfolding. Of course, the overfolding preflop is extreme, but knits also overfold postflop in the majority of scenarios. And this might seem counterintuitive as mentioned. To give an example, knits fold to multi-barrel aggression lines. So one of the things that we can do against a knit is we can triple barrel bluff. Now, the reason why that might seem counterintuitive is because the knit has called the flop, signaling interest. He's called the turn, signaling sustained interest in the pot. So now he must be reaching the river with a fairly strong range. So it might be logical to think, well, I'm not going to pull the trig on a triple barrel because it's a knit opponent profile. He's indicated interest in the pot so far. Surely pulling the trigger on the river triple barrel will be suicidal in the situation because my opponent is a knit. He has a strong range. So that sounds very logical. When we compare that to aggregated data on knit opponent profiles, we find that it's not true. The knit just overfolds on every given street. Now that's not to say that he doesn't have a strong range when he reaches the river. He does have a very strong range. But it's really to do with understanding how the psychology of this type of opponent is wired. Yes, they have a strong range, but this is a very risk averse opponent profile. Despite having that strong range, they are willing to make some very big laydowns. Really, a knit, it's almost just a player with a very extreme 
monster under the bed syndrome. They're always assuming that we have something extremely strong, stronger than we do in reality. So they're going to be overfolding as a result. Think of them as a paranoid type of opponent. They're assuming we always have a set. So if they have that paranoia, and yet they suddenly decide to check raise our turn C bet, for example, or check raise our river bet, despite those paranoia levels, despite that assumption that we always have the nuts, then they must have the stone cold giga nuts. But until they actually take that aggressive line, they're going to be extremely paranoid that we have something very strong. They're going to be overfolding as a result. So as long as our knit opponent is not taking any aggressive actions, we can completely steamroll them. So as a quick summary here, knits will overfold to multi-barrel aggression lines. It might seem counterintuitive because they have that stronger range, but the idea is we can exploit a knit's weak, tight nature even when they have that stronger range. And all of the common automatic profit spots are overfolded by nits. We won't go through them all in detail right now, but think about situations like fall to river probe, fall to turn probe, fall to river float bet, fall to delayed sea bet, fall to stop and go. All of these are situations where the average nit is going to be overfolding. And what's more, they'll be folding more often than a typical reg, despite having a stronger range on average than a typical reg in each of the corresponding scenarios. If there's one key takeaway from this particular podcast episode, it's that it's very important to quickly identify if we're playing in an environment that's completely flooded with knit opponent profiles. So we need some kind of access to HUD stats. Just to take the two sites that we've mentioned, for no specific reason, other than the fact that these sites do have a little bit of high level knit activity going on in the lower limit fast format games, we've got poker stars where you can run a HUD. So if you can run a HUD, you should be running a HUD because you want to figure out who are the guys that aren't really there to play poker. They're just there to maybe farm top set and then try and get the chips in. GG obviously doesn't allow HUDs, but they do have the smart HUD. So we can still figure out even if we don't have detailed information on our opponents, we can figure out, again, who is there to play some poker and who's there really just to fold a bunch and wait for some strong hands. So as soon as we've identified the type players, the next objective is to get a colored tag on those opponents. As a rough guide, if you're playing 25 and L or below, we should be getting a knit tag on any player that has a VPIP of 18% or below over 50 hands. Now, as you start to move up the limits, as you get to 50 now, 100 now, you'll notice that these types of players don't exist anymore. Like we said, this is something that's very specific to lower limit and usually fast format games. Having said that, the principles are still important. You may find that in your 50 now online games or your 100 now online games, there are still some fairly tight players and you still want to be aware of them. You still want to leave a colored tag. You might just need to adjust that threshold for what makes someone a nit. So if you're playing in a 200 nil game, the nits are now the very tight regs who have 20, 21 VPIP or lower, but not 18 or lower because these player profiles don't exist at that particular online stake. In other words, feel free to adjust this threshold based on your specific environment. But the point is there should be a threshold where we're seeing an opponent who is below average in terms of VPIP. They're not really there to get involved in hands. They're just trying to get us in a situation where we have something fairly strong. They have something even stronger. They want all the chips to go in. They want us to think it's a cooler, but it's not really a cooler because of their play style. And we need to be able to find spots where we can hear a fold against such opponents. So hopefully after listening to this, you understand the importance of identifying whether you are in an environment that's heavily occupied by knit opponent profiles. I'd say that tagging all of the knits in your pool might be one of the most important actions you take in order to ensure profitability. And if I am playing in such environments, it's definitely a big part of my method of operations is get on the tables, one of my first jobs is just leaving color tags on all of the guys who aren't really there to get involved because 
I don't want to be experiencing that cooler effect. I don't want to be in a situation where I'm making a standard stack off post flop according to GTO and it feels like I'm being coolered, but I'm not really being coolered because that's obviously very bad for our win rate. But the other thing is that if we don't know that our opponents are knit, we're missing out on all of those exploitative opportunities that we've discussed throughout this podcast episode. Well, that's pretty much it. Thanks very much for listening, guys. This was Coach Weasel, and this was the Red Chip Poker Podcast.